Uh, we're, uh, the Senator's uh, going to be willing to um, have a little bit of a QA and a with some of the folks. Katie Hardwick over here in the corner has a mic. Because of the size of the room, if you could raise your hand and allow Katie to get to you, uh, it would really help as far as being able to hear. So, uh, do we have a, some questions for the Senator? Senator, uh, thank you for coming back to Lexington. Uh, the question that's more along the lines of a what makes you tick kind of question. Uh, like you, I agree with many of the precepts of Ayn Rand and the philosophies of the books. But personally, I also struggle within myself to reconcile that with the teachings of my faith and the compassionate side uh, to support those less fortunate who are maybe even non-producers. And I was wondering, internally, do you also struggle with that or do you are you able to compartmentalize and, and look at it more from a macro point of view? I look at uh, a lot of issues in two different realms in the sense that what the government should or shouldn't do is not always the same as what an individual should or shouldn't do. I personally think that we are our brother's keeper and believe in the Christian humanitarian notion that we do take care of people and that we wouldn't let people uh, suffer or fail. I also think from a practical point of view that capitalism provides the most amount of wealth, the most amount of jobs, and is the most uh, humanitarian of all the systems. So I don't see necessarily a contradiction. I also look at if I wanted to help somebody and I had $100, go through this thought experiment, who would you like to give it to? The federal government or the Salvation Army? I think there's no question the Salvation Army would make better use of your $100 than the federal government. The federal government squanders and wastes and has so much going on, and it's because inherently government is just not efficient. When Jefferson talked about government's best that governs least, it's because he knew government didn't run by the profit motive and didn't efficiently distribute things. And we have to have government, but that's why we want to keep government at a minimum, and even things like charity are best handled voluntarily. It doesn't mean there won't be any safety net, but it means we should always encourage and be more fan because it, it helps more people, and that's private charity. One of the, one of the key principles that the U.S. Constitution was based in, on was <clears throat> keeping the power far away from the federal government and closer to the people agreed. And that's what the Tenth Amendment's all about, as you know. And um, Thomas Jefferson said that it's the duty of the states, in fact it says the rightful remedy back in 1798, to for the states to, uh, when there's federal encroachment, like there's a gross violation of the Tenth Amendment, that's what we have today, and you gave several examples in your speech earlier. But uh, in light of the federal encroachment uh, in our lives uh, and, and of the principle of keeping back the power close to the people, what are you doing as, uh, I know you're a U.S. Senator working in D.C., uh, but um, you have connections here and influence here in the state. And so I would ask you, what are you doing to encourage uh, local state legislators to uh, practice uh, to at least start the process of nullification of federal law. Does that make sense what I'm asking? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I've met your Attorney General a couple times, <laughs> and uh, I've been trying to encourage him both before and since the election that uh, he should join the uh, Tenth Amendment movement to uh, repeal Obamacare. Thirty-two, I think, Attorney General have signed on to that. A uh, federal judge has ruled it unconstitutional. Many states are not implementing it. It's going to cost quite a bit of money to implement. I think it's a better than 50% chance the Supreme Court will strike it down. And uh, therefore, I think it would be a good idea for Kentucky not to implement it and to join the lawsuit. So if anybody knows the Attorney General and can pass that along for me, that'd be great. I think you know, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments seriously are, are very, very important, and I am a big believer that if the law, if the power was not enumerated and given to the federal government, it is left to the states and the people, respectively. The biggest driver and the biggest so-called constitutional justification for big government is the Commerce Clause. And what has happened over a 70-year period is we've expanded that to mean almost anything. 
I tell people if my shoes were made in Tennessee, they can regulate my walking in Kentucky. That's become a very indirect test, and I think that's a big mistake. The federal judge who struck down in Virginia, who struck down Obamacare, said that if inactivity, basically the inactivity of not buying health insurance is commerce, then no aspect of our life will be free from regulation. It's very serious what's going on with Obamacare, much more serious than just health care. It's the concept of what the government can and cannot do. I would love to see the Supreme Court actually reverse Wickard, which is the case from back in the 40s where they told farmers how much they could grow and couldn't grow, even if they didn't sell it, because they said it could indirectly, by not selling it, affect the interstate price of wheat. I think that's a ridiculous test, and I'd love to see them overturn that, but I, I may be a little, I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to make the Supreme Court say, but uh, I think the Ninth and Tenth Amendment and, and, and obeying it is very important. Also, because we're short of money, there's going to be more adversarial relationship between federal government, state government, and local government, because everybody's short of money, and particularly until we get out of this recession, I see more of that controversy going on between either you should do it, or you should do it, or you should do it. The big problem with local government and state government is we're always telling them what to do, but then we don't give them money to do it. Hi, <coughs> Hello, Senator. Jan Charles Graham, we were talking out in the foyer. I know you've introduced a lot of legislation. I don't know how many bills, but procedurally, number one, I mean, how did you get that many bills introduced that quickly? And then secondly, what, if any of them, and I don't mean this in a flip way, have a chance of passing? We've introduced several things, and I, I was sort of a believer when I was running for office and then when elected that we should have specific proposals. The media is always like, what are you going to cut? And I think you lose your credibility and lose your argument if you don't specifically say what you would cut. So we introduced a uh, bill that would cut $500 billion and we laid it out where we would cut it and how we would do it. The only way you can get to such a large number, well, one, you have to acknowledge or understand that government increased spending by $700 billion from 2008 to 2010. So when we talk about $30 billion or $60 billion, even if it is off of that curve, it's not even touching the spending that we increased over the previous two years. Uh, we also introduced a five-year plan to balance the budget. I'm of the opinion that if the budget doesn't balance in your term of office, or in your lifetime, that uh, it may not be a serious proposal. You know, the left is giving Congressman Ryan's plan such a hard time, it never balances. I'm criticizing it from the other side because you, I think you've got to have balancing as your goal at some point in time. But uh, I think Ryan's plan is better than the president's. The president proposed to add $11 trillion to the debt. This is how the numbers get funny. His proposal that he released a month ago, which was his budget, would add $11 trillion in debt over 10 years. Now the president's come out this last week and said he's going to cut that by $4 trillion. So everybody's talking about him cutting the deficit by $4 trillion. All he's doing is cutting his proposed $11 trillion by $4 trillion. So now we're back to the president, if you want to word this correctly, is going to add $7 trillion to the deficit over the next, or to the debt over the next 10 years. So it gets, the, the math gets funny, and that's why I like to put it in simple terms. This year we will spend more than last year. This year the deficit's more than last year. I can't understand that to mean that government's getting smaller yet. Yeah.